dealing with nothing else but ideology, right? The, our guiding beliefs, our general philosophy. I'm a Pan-Africanist. I'm an integrationist. I'm a socialist. Nawapi, Nation of Islam, Hebrew, more. Da -da 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 -da. Right? All philosophy. No strategy. No tactics. We keep fighting over the idea. Okay? And our argument is what? Regardless of your particular political or religious philosophy, all black people need homes. All black people need health care. All black children need children. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Hold on. <laughs> all African children need an education. We all need jobs. We all need shelter. Do you follow me? So regardless of the different ideologies we may have in the room, there's some objectives that we all need to accomplish. So let's work on them together and stop all the fighting. The idea is we all have to have the same ideology in order to work together. That's a lie. That's a damn lie. The white nations of the world, do they all agree? Hell to no. They simply agree on certain objectives and they work on them. And when they don't disagree, they when they do disagree, they leave that to each other's individual nation or faction. We got to do the same thing. Work on the basics. Because at the end of the day, regardless of what we believe, black folks still need those basics and essentials. Okay? So strategy, tactics, ideology, that guys. So if I'm a Pan-Africanist, okay, then obviously my ideology is based on what? Working internationally with all African people because I don't see how you're going to defeat an international enemy without an international effort. So Pan-Africanism is common sense. That's an announcement? Yeah, you got the gym exposed. Oh, the gym, okay. Oh! <laughs> okay. Let's, talk, let's talk about the code of white supremacy. Okay, this is the white supremacy handbook. These. I think I got my test material in the trunk. Let me go get my trunk. <laughs> That's okay. You don't want to this, man. Oh. <laughs> I need an IEP. Okay. These are the laws that Europeans generally use globally to deal with African people. I don't care if you go to London, go to the Caribbean, come here, Asia, Africa, I don't care where you are, these are the rules, the guiding principles that Europeans use to interact with black folks. As we go through these, you're going to see this is how your boss deal with you if you work with a white person. Those of y'all who got white friends and all that kind of stuff, you're going to see they deal with you the same way too. Okay, number one, never let black people know what you're thinking. Intentionally mislead them if you must. You never know what they think. Your white friends, you do not know what they are thinking. They intentionally mislead you on purpose. The nature. You say it's because, uh, you know, they're inherently evil. Maybe, maybe not. But what I do know is that within white culture, one of the ways that they've been able to outsmart us for so long is that military science is built into their thinking as a people. Are y'all following me? Yes. Mm. Study them at every period of yes, their history. Yes, yes. Their whole culture evolves around military science. And why must it? Because they are minority on the planet. They are minority. So they understand that the potential for extermination on a biological level without weapons is always present because they are a minority with a recessive people. So they are always conscious of the need to survive. So if they walk into a room like this amongst all us African people, they automatically start thinking about how they're going to take it over, mm -hmm. how they're going to end up in control, and how they can get rid of those who are dissident true. to their true. particular idea. True. It's built into the culture. So my thing is I don't get caught up in the whole white devils thing. Mm -hmm. Okay? I deal with it on a military level. And on a military level, they simply carry out strategy and tactic to keep us where we at. Okay? All that other stuff might be true, but that don't concern me. Okay? I'm concerned with the practical aspect of their behavior. And military science is built into it. So when they lie to you, okay, they don't see anything wrong with it because that's part of military warfare to deceive your enemy. The problem is they see you as the enemy, but you don't see them as yours. So you tell them the truth, but they lie to you. Okay? Rule number two always try to figure out what black people are thinking and planning. Always try to figure out what black people are thinking and planning so you can disrupt it or capitalize upon it. Let me give you an example. Kwanzaa. We celebrate Kwanzaa, nothing wrong with it. I don't have a problem, you know, if you celebrate Kwanzaa. But my question to you is, who benefits the most from Kwanzaa? Black people or white people? Did you know that most money made during Kwanzaa, selling Kwanzaa artifacts, is made by Macy's? 
and one other large white department store. More than 50% of all Kwanzaa money goes to two white corporations. You see that? So they either disrupt it, which would have been to do what? Destroy Kwanzaa. Or capitalize on it, which was to do what? Market Kwanzaa. So their whole thing is, we ain't got to fight it, just get paid. So during Kwanzaa week, the McDonald's workers have on their Kwanzaa hat, right? They have on their Kwanzaa vest. United States government, Kwanzaa stamps, so you go out and buy some stamps. I mean, look at who makes the money off the Kwanzaa. That's why you have to always ask yourself, the first question you ask yourself with any issue, homosexuality, miseducation, mass incarceration, black male-female relationship problems, who benefits from this predicament? Whenever you see one of our problems, who benefits, that should be your first question. Because if you answer that correctly, you'll be able to understand everything else. What do they always say? If you don't understand white supremacy, nothing else will make sense to you. Dr. Francis Cresswell said. If you don't understand that, you can't understand anything. People look at Obama. I don't understand. Why do they put a white man in the White House? Excuse me. Well, he's a white man. But why do they put a black man in the White House? Why? It's real simple. Because in the philosophy of white supremacy, Whenever you can use a member of the oppressed to symbolize freedom for the oppressed group, you can make them think they're doing better when they're doing worse. Obama was not put in the White House. They destroyed the black movement with the Super Bowl, okay? Obama was put in the White House for Africa. Remember, just before he gets elected, what happens? We find that 70% of the unused gas and oil on the planet is in the Gulf of Guinea. Then we find more in South Africa. We find oil off the coast of Somalia. And like, my goodness, Africa may have always had more gas and oil than the entire Middle East. But African nations don't trust us anymore. Remember, we decimated the whole country for this stuff. So we're not just going to be able to go back in and have them work with us to re-exploit, recolonize, we got to come up with another strategy. How about a black president with a father who came from Africa? And I can tell you as somebody who was in Africa in 2008, during Obama's campaign, the Africans in Africa were more brainwashed about who he really, rep who he really is and who he really represented more than us in the States. In Nigeria, I couldn't tell them nothing about him. They didn't want to hear it. Brother Umar, you are wrong. He is a god sin. South Africa, same thing. I couldn't say nothing about Obama because all they could see is what? Somebody with African blood is in the White House. They couldn't see beyond it, which means what? They were outsmarted by white supremacy strategy and tactics.